Hello, friends. Uh, so today we are going to discuss something very interesting and uh, this very basic to quantum mechanics, which is known as the basic postulates of quantum mechanics. So these postulates are the basic foundation of the quantum mechanics. These are the uh, basic thumb, you can say in sort of a rules on which uh, the quantum mechanics, formulation of quantum mechanics is based. So we are going to talk about that today. So there are, there are basically five uh, postulates, basic postulates of quantum mechanics. So uh, let me start with them. The first postulate is regarding the physical state of a system, of a quantum mechanical system. So let me write down the postulate one is about this physical state of a system. Okay, so it, uh, postulate one says that uh, any instant of at any instant of time t, the physical state of a system is described by by a state vector cat psi t, which is an element of a Hilbert space. Okay, uh, so cat psi t is the state vector, so called state vector, and uh, it's, it's, it is the symbol that we use to describe the physical state of a system at any instant time t. And this, uh, the speciality of this cat psi t is that it's an abstract state vector in a sense that of Hilbert space. It, it has all the information regarding the physical state of the system. It has the information about the position. It has the information about the momentum. It has the information about the energy and various other physical uh, variables. It has all the information of the system contained in itself. The, that is uh, the first postulate that we assume that cat psi t is the physical state of the system at an instant of time t and it contains all the information. Uh, it contains all the information about the system. And so now it's up to us that which information we want to extract from it. It has all the information. Now it's our job how to extract out that information that we'll see as we go on, as we go along, how to extract out those information. Now the second postulate talks about, which is very important postulate, talks about the physical quantities, the physical observables, right? The observables. Like suppose um, we want to suppose we have an electron in some kind of a potential and we want to measure it suppose let's say momentum or the position or energy for that matter so these are the physical quantities physical observable which we can measure in our experiments so every physical uh, physically measurable quantity so called observable in quantum mechanics they are represented by hermitian operators okay so every physical observable in quantum mechanics is represented by an Hermitian operator. Well, why Hermitian operator? Because Hermitian operators have real eigenvalues. Okay. And uh, the these eigenvalues are nothing but uh, are, they are the same values that you will measure in the physical experiment. Suppose I want to uh, measure the linear momentum uh, of an electron in a particular uh, quantum state. Then whatever value I will get in the in my physical measurement, in my experiment, that corresponds to the eigenvalues of that matrix of Hermitian, of that Hermitian matrix by which I'm representing the uh, my linear momentum in quantum mechanics. So that will have uh, certain eigenvalues and that will correspond to the physical observable quantities in uh, in experiment. Okay, so that's the main crucial point about the postulate two and the main assumption I would, uh, main postulate I would say of quantum mechanics. Okay, and you know uh, uh, the different properties of the Hermitian uh, operators or Hermitian matrix. All the eigenvalues are real, and if you calculate the eigenvectors corresponding to different eigenvalues, they are orthogonal to each other. Okay, uh, so all these things are, are already true for the Hermitian and practicing operator we have from your probably you have done a course on mathematics or based on that. Uh, 
number three postulate is it is about the as i said the measurement and the eigenvalues of the operators as i've already stated that uh, the when you make a measurement okay, so of a particular state suppose how do we represent that physical measurement that experiment that we do in reality in our laboratory how it is represented on paper uh, in quantum mechanics and in mathematical language is that suppose i have a, i want to measure the any physical quantity which i'm represented by o hat so i have used o so that uh, uh, I mean, for the abbreviation as an operator, but that could be anything. It could be operator, could be the angular momentum operator, it could be linear momentum operator, it could be the Hermish, uh, the um, uh, Hamiltonian operator, it could be any any physical observable. You know, by, uh, and we have already uh, said in the postulate too that the, any physical observable will be represented by the admission operator. So this O height is any physical measurable quantity that we are on to measure in our experiment. And in a mathematical language will represent that we are actually acting this O hat operator on the cat side T. Remember, cat side T from the postulate one is the uh, state which contains all the information. It contains the information about the linear momentum, it contains information about the all the physical observable um, you know, quantities in it. So now we want to extract out that information so that we are applying O hat on it, and O hat is a particular operator like linear momentum operator, position operator, angular momentum operator, or the energy operator. By by action of which on this state, uh, we are going to get certain values. Okay, uh, and that values that we get, so called the eigenvalues, uh, will correspond to the physical measurable quantity in quantum mechanics. So first of all, we know the eigenvalue equation is that uh, suppose you have an A hat operator and it acts on let's say cat phi in cat phi is suppose the eigenstate of a so you will get some numerical value and this state back this is this is called the eigenvalue equation equation but here cat phi uh, t is an abstract state vector okay it doesn't need to be uh, the eigenstate of o hat necessarily it may or may not be if it it is an eigenstate we will get a numerical value and the state back uh, the eigen value equation if it is not then we will have to write down cat psi t as a linear combination of uh, all the eigen states course, uh, of o hat okay so maybe something like this i should write and so on and so forth then you will get one of the eigen values when the o hat x on cat psi t so let's say we get a value C2, suppose, and uh, it reduces this physical state of the system, one of the eigenvalues of O hat, which is correspond to C2 and phi 2 Okay, so that's the uh, third postulate that defines the and uh, action of an operator on a state and also uh, it uh, relates with the physical experiment that we do in our laboratory. It makes, makes it clear that what will happen when a, uh, when you operate an operator on a state, what will happen to that state? Okay. Now, uh, the fourth and uh, again, very, very important uh, postulate of quantum mechanics is that uh, uh, now what is the probability of getting different eigenvalues? So your system is in a cat psi t, for example, it is not a particular eigenstate of any particular operator, then um, we don't know which eigenvalue are going to get uh, out of possible, let's say, n values of a uh, physical observable, O hat, we don't know which one is going to get, which one we are going to get. So we can do what we can do in quantum mechanics. We can only calculate the probability of getting different eigenvalues before making an experiment. However, when we make an experiment, then of course we get a one value uh, and we compel actually the state of the system to be uh, in a one particular eigenstate of the operator. Uh, for which we are measuring the eigenvalues or for which we are measuring the values in experiment. Okay, so I repeat that uh, when we want to measure uh, a physical quantity, what we do, we uh, actually operate that operator on cat side t. Now, before making an ex ex um, experiment in the laboratory, we cannot, may, uh, we cannot tell that out of n possible eigenvalues, which eigenvalue we are going to get in this. We can only talk about the possibilities of the outcome. We can only talk about the probabilities of the outcome. That what is the probability of getting, let's say, um, uh, first eigenvalue? What is the probability of uh, getting the uh, second eigenvalue or third eigenvalue and so on and so forth? Okay, so that postulate four actually talks about the 
uh, talks about the rule of by which you can calculate the probability of getting a particular eigenvalue before making an experiment okay so the postulate four talks about the probability of an outcome And that's uh, suppose I my system was in cat site T before making an uh, experiment on the physical state, right? And I want to uh, measure, let's say, O hat operator, and uh, O hat has uh, one of the eigenvalues, let's say, A n, and uh, um, it has two possibilities in fact the o hat can have discrete eigenvalues o hat can have continuous eigenvalues suppose we are dis uh, discussing the case of discrete eigenvalues you know, for uh, for the time being i will discuss about the continuous states as well uh, o hat is has one of the eigenvalues as a n so the probability of getting a n eigenvalues that can be calculated before making the measurement and uh, that can be calculated suppose a n eigenvalues has a corresponding eigen state phi n okay or let's say psi n so psi n t psi t more or less square divided by psi t so this is the uh, denominator is the inner product of psi with psi if psi is already normalized this is going to give us one okay if it is non not normalized then we'll have to keep the uh, denominator as well and psi and t here is the psi and t is the eigen state uh, of operator o hat corresponding to an eigenvalue okay so that's the basic thumb rule of calculating the probability of a particular outcome and this outcome that we have discussed is first of all the discrete case and it is non-degenerate case as well non-degenerate means that uh, you don't get the same a and eigenvalues more than one time like uh, a particular uh, a Hermitian matrix uh, we might have dealt in mathematics that uh, may have let's suppose three cross three square matrix which is Hermitian can have three eigenvalues so out of these three all three can be distinct or they can uh, few of the eigenvalues may be degenerate they may be repeated like uh, one two two or three two two or anything else so if you are getting the uh, repeated eigenvalues that means they are degenerate okay, if we have discussed just now is for the discrete non-degenerate case non-degenerate means you will have all the distinct eigenvalues like a n i have represented so values are let's say a1 a2 a3 a4 a4 up to a n but uh, what happened if the case is degenerate case then when the eigenvalues are degenerate in nature so this and for the discrete case only so for discrete and degenerate case degenerate eigenvalues Okay, so discrete and degenerate eigenvalues, the same relation that we have written down, the same uh, mathematical rule that we have written will be slightly modified. We have to sum over all such possibilities, all uh, such repetitions. Let's say an values come uh, across m times. So I have to sum over from i to m, psi uh, m, psi n, psi t, i more or less square divided by psi t psi t okay so what we see here is so this is also psi and i t if you wish okay so uh, that is basically that we have calculated different eigenvectors corresponding to different eigenvalues i mean maybe uh, they have same eigenvalues but we can calculate the eigenvectors and you get distant eigenvectors let's say and uh, this uh, distant eigenvectors so we have to take the inner product of all those uh, eigenstates uh, of different um, eigenvalues with psi t and uh, have to summed over uh, the inner product modulus of inner product square with the psi and this is how we calculate the uh, for the 
discrete and degenerate eigenvalues. What is the probability? Now, an is a degenerate eigenvalue. Degenerate eigenvalue means I've already explained that you get this eigenvalues for more than one time. So when uh, for all those times that you get this value, we calculate the corresponding eigenstate, a corresponding eigenvectors, corresponding eigenstate, and which are nothing but psi and it. Okay, so these are the uh, I tending from one to three or up to m. So these are m degenerate eigenvalues. An has m degenerate. It that is it occurs m times. So for all m times, we calculate the uh, um, eigenstates uh, and uh, eigenvectors. So these are nothing but psi and it. Okay, and then we have to calculate according to this. Now, of course, natural question arises. What happens when your uh, physical observable or operator has the continuous eigenvalue instead of uh, the discrete eigenvalues. So this uh, um, relation will be a little modified and uh, uh, will be written for the continuous case as follows. So for, uh, let me write down for uh, continuous, for continuous eigen, uh, eigenvalues of operator O hat. So here you cannot ask that then in that case the question what is the probability of getting a particular eigenvalue rather what you will ask here in the continuous case is that what is the probability of getting uh, eigenvalue in some range let's say a to a plus d a what is the probability of getting the uh, value when you measure actually measure it into laboratory what is the probability that you are going to getting the uh, going to get the eigenvalues between a to a plus d a for example for example uh, if your particle is uh, moving let's say electron is moving or any other quantum particle is moving in one dimension uh, let's say in uh, x direction so what is the probability of getting this electron uh, in this, let's say, x2, x plus dx uh, range of length. Uh, so that is the question that we ask. And the you know the probability density is given by dpx over dx. This is called the probability density. Probability density. So that is nothing but the same uh, a continuum version of what we already discussed. dpx over dx is nothing but what? We calculate the uh, probability of getting or finding the electron in the range x to x plus dx that's that is calculated by modulus of psi square over psi psi what is the i what is the probability hmm, probability density what is the probability density that a measurement measurement of o hat yields a value between a to a plus d a what is the probability suppose we ask this so that is d p a over d a is psi a square divided by uh, psi psi the last postulate if you will talk about it the postulate five so that is nothing but the Schrodinger wave equation that talks about the time evolution of the physical state so time evolution time evolution of the physical state gets psi t. Now that is governed by that is governed by this should nothing but the Schrodinger wave equation. So you see the Schrodinger wave equation in quantum mechanics is introduced and as an postulate. We cannot prove it because there is no um, proof of Schrodinger equation from the first principle we can um, so it is introduced as an uh, postulate in quantum mechanics okay where h hat is the of course transmission operator corresponding to the total energy of the system the Hamiltonian operator okay this is how the uh, physical states of a quantum mechanical system evolves with time okay so